Okay, so I'm just going to move on to a new chapter now on respiration. So just the outcomes of this, you need to be able to define respiration, that there are two types of respiration, aerobic and anaerobic. You need to be able to give an equation for both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. And you need to be able to explain why respiration is considered to be both a chemical and a biological process. Factors that affect um, respiration and then a demonstration showing respiration occurring. OK, now I'm going to put this PowerPoint on Edmodo afterwards so that you can copy the slides into your into your notebooks. OK, now just a, a few quick points before we start. Energy is the ability to do work. Now, don't think of work as just like homework or physical work. You need to think about work as anything that the cells or the organism does. So remember in first year when you were talking about the characteristics of life or features of life, you would have learned about movement, growth, sensitivity. So all of those things that organisms do require energy. So for you to be able to think about a problem or to see something, to hear something, to grow, you need energy for all of that. So that's what we would consider work, okay? The more work you do, obviously, the more energy you need. And we get energy from foods like carbohydrates. How do we get energy from our food? Well, we breathe in oxygen and the oxygen and the glucose go to your cells. And then in your cells, you convert food into energy. So that would be the definition of respiration is the controlled release of energy from food. Controlled word there is important because the release of energy from food is controlled by enzymes that we'll talk about later. Respiration is not the same thing as breathing. Sometimes people will say, oh, respiration is breathing. It's not. Breathing is when you take in oxygen and you give out carbon dioxide. Your lungs um, allow you to do that. Respiration is, remember we said, the release of energy from food. Now, respiration can either be aerobic or anaerobic. Aerobic requires oxygen, whereas anaerobic does not require oxygen. This is the word equation look for aerobic respiration. Glucose plus oxygen, making energy, carbon dioxide and water. Now, like we said, this reaction has to happen in every single cell of your body. So cells in your toes, cells in your brain, cells in your fingertips. And how does the glucose and oxygen get to the cells down in your big toe? Well, remember last year you'd have learned about the digestive system where glucose is produced from the breaking down or from the digesting of your food that you would eat. So if you had a bowl of pasta or something for your lunch, you eat that, goes into your stomach, digestion occurs in the stomach and it continues in the small intestine. And then your pasta is broken down to small pieces of glucose. And that glucose is small enough to pass into the bloodstream from the small intestine. And then the blood takes it to your cells. Where do you get the oxygen from? Well, you get the oxygen from your lungs. The blood picks up oxygen in your lungs and the blood carries oxygen to your cells where it meets the glucose and then respiration occurs. Now, would you think respiration is considered to be a chemical change? What did we say a chemical change was? Well, a chemical change is where a new substance is made. So yes, you're converting glucose and oxygen into something new. So respiration is a chemical change. All right. Now, um, anaerobic respiration then occurs where oxygen is not present. So it's the release of energy from food when oxygen is not in the reaction. So look at the differences here. Now you just have glucose on the left, no oxygen. Now the type of um, respiration that occurs anaerobically depends on where the glucose, where this reaction is happening, I suppose. So in the first instance there where you have glucose producing ethanol and carbon dioxide, that would happen in yeast cells. So you know that yeast is used for brewing, for making beer. You know that yeast is used for making bread. So yeast is um, an organism. It is a living thing. And when you have yeast with glucose, with no oxygen, you produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. Sometimes glucose is converted to energy and you also produce lactic acid. That would happen in humans. So in muscle tissue in humans where you have, where, you know, if you were running a marathon or you were playing long match or something, if the match went to extra time, then you mightn't have enough oxygen in your body to, to sustain aerobic respiration. So the glucose in your muscle cells starts to be converted into energy anaerobically without oxygen and that produces lactic acid and then a build-up of lactic acid is what causes cramp so if your glucose is being converted to energy without oxygen in your body then you're going to produce lactic acid so how do you stop that deep breathing making sure that you have lots of oxygen in your muscles for aerobic respiration there's much less energy produced when the glucose is converted to energy anaerobically so aerobic is is more efficient 
Is it a biological process? Yes, it is. Why? Because it happens in living cells. So if the if this thing, if this reaction happens in living cells, you can say that it's biological. Okay, anaerobic respiration happens in the cytoplasm, whereas um, aerobic respiration happens in the mitochondria. So because it's considered to be a biological process, because it happens in living things, and a chemical process, because it, it makes something new, we call respiration a biochemical process process okay now what factors would affect the rate of respiration in an organism well if you're converting glucose and oxygen into the energy then obviously the availability of glucose and oxygen would affect the rate of this reaction so if there's no glucose you won't have any respiration or if it's if there's very little amount of glucose then it'll slow down the rate of respiration so um they'd be the factors that would affect temperature of course also affects the rate of respiration all reactions that occur in your body are controlled by enzymes. Now, you would have met enzymes last year when you were doing digestion and you would have talked about amylase digesting starch or breaking down starch. But enzymes control important reactions that happen so that our body functions properly. Body um, enzymes or human enzymes work best at a temperature of 37 degrees. That's why it's important you talk about people have you know the dangers of having a fever where your body temperature goes above maybe 38 degrees, where your enzymes start to become, um, they, they start to affect, the temperature starts to affect your enzymes. Maybe the enzymes loses its shape and if it loses its shape, it doesn't function properly. And therefore, some reactions then that happen in your body, um, you know, those reactions mightn't um, work as well as they should. And that would affect that would affect you. So temperature definitely affects the rate of respiration because it affects the enzymes that are controlling respiration. This would be a graph that you might draw after an experiment. So look at the y axis is showing the rate of respiration and the x axis you're showing your your temperature. OK, so you can read what you've learned there yourself. There are two common questions then that you can have a go at. So just before I finish, I just want to show you. This would be the kind of, ex of ex experiment that we would do if we were in school. So just be having a look at it uh, at home and you can maybe write the method for it. I'll write that stuff on Edmodo in a second. But what do you need um, to investigate a factor that affects respiration? Now, this factor, they're going to investigate temperature. So temperature is going to be the independent variable. So look down here. They're changing the temperature of the water bath. They're using the thermometer. That's their instrument. They're changing the temperature of the water bath to 10, 20, 30 and 40. And how are they measuring the effect that the change of temperature has on the rate of respiration? Well, they're using glucose, which is the sugar. And look, they're using yeast. Why are they putting it in a cylinder? Because the carbon dioxide that's produced when you react the glucose and the, and, and the yeast is going to produce a, a, a foam, I suppose. The bubbles will produce a foam. And you can measure the height of foam that's produced. Did you see? So if that was your, you know, you'll be able to read from the scale on the graduated cylinder how much foam is produced at the different temperatures. So the method is there. So, you know, that would how, and then you could maybe be, maybe I suppose if you're trying to measure rate um, of respiration, you could just measure the volume of foam produced per minute. So you time with a timer, you start the timer when you add the glucose to the yeast in the cylinder. And then after one minute, you would record the height of foam that you've produced. Okay. Now, just one last thing I want to show you there. You could do this at home if you had yeast yourself. If you don't have yeast at home, don't worry about it. If you can't get it, you can get it in a shop. But, you know, if you are not going to the shops or whatever, don't worry. But if anyone can do this experiment at home, then you might video it and then put it on Edmodo for everyone else to see. So the, the instructions are, oops, sorry. The instructions are given to you there, look. And you could maybe be, you know, um, as I said, post it on Edmodo if you're able if you're able to do it. OK, thank you.